All right, Mountain View, so great to see y'all this morning. I'm glad that since we've arrived into town that we've at least brought one positive thing, a southern accent from Gina Stockton. <laughs> Can I get an amen? <laughs> one of the greatest joys of my life is getting to be dad to Addie and Bauer. And our kids are kind of at that age right now where they're starting to discover and unpack and figure out what they want to do with their life. Our daughter, uh, when she was younger, wanted to be a school teacher and uh, now has since transformed into she wants to be an actress. And so I'm like, fantastic. Let's do this. Our son, uh, when he was younger, wanted to be a police officer. And then we moved to Florida and he's like, I want to be an alligator wrestler. He, he saw... Uh, at, at this place called Gatorland, he saw this guy wrestling alligators, and he's like, this is what I want to do for my, for my livelihood. And I'm like, follow your dreams, son. We were talking about this the other day, and uh, the question was, Mommy and Daddy, what did you want to be when you grew up? And my answer was, I wanted to be a dentist. And here I am. And uh, obviously that did not work out, but it started the conversation again more recently with our kids, and our son said when he was asked, I just want to be like my daddy. You're crying. I'm not crying. But isn't that what Jesus wants of all of us, uh, that we're just like our heavenly father? Now, Bauer doesn't, he's not wanting to come to all of the meetings that I have. He's not wanting to balance budgets or write sermons. He's just going through life wanting to be like his father. And when it comes to our faith journey, that's exactly what Jesus wants for each of us. Now, we tend to overcomplicate it like we do with a lot of things. We tend to overcomplicate it, but Jesus is not expecting us as his followers to just go around and heal everybody and he's not expecting us to fly around with our super spiritual hero capes and put out little immoral fires all around the world and he's just inviting us to a very simple lifestyle and it's a lifestyle that comes on the heels of his invitation follow me because for the christian for the follower of jesus our life ought to be wrapped up in, surrounded by, foundationally built on this whole idea of living like Jesus. We talk about this in church often, and we talk about this in a sense of discipleship or a sense of spiritual growth, and we talk about wanting to grow as a follower of Jesus, and when it comes to growing, when it comes to growth and maturity, we don't measure According to scripture, according to Jesus, we don't measure our growth by the knowledge that we have. It's not about knowledge as much as it is about who we are becoming. Because here's what I want you to walk away with today. Who we become is more important than what we do. Who we are becoming is so much more important than what we are doing because growing is not just about doing. It's about being more like Jesus. And for followers of Jesus, we have missed this so often. Because the problem is we get wrapped up into thinking that we're growing as long as we're doing more religious deeds. We're growing as long as we're amassing and uh, compiling more information. We're growing as long as we're living right and attending church. Which in my mind is such a tragedy that this movement that was once irresistible for culture has dissolved into doing certain things in certain ways and saying certain things in certain ways and then we call it and we label that discipleship and we assume that that is growth. But for far too long, we've associated discipleship and growth with what we do. We have a quiet time. We pray before a meal, we go to a Bible study, and we just assume that if we're doing those things that we're growing. But the problem is then the moments or the seasons or the weeks or the months or the years that we don't do those things and miss one of those markers of growth, whether we forget to do a quiet time, we forget to pray over a meal and give that meal to the devil, or we 
don't have this robust devotional life, we just get discouraged. And that discouragement leads to a place where we just feel defeated. And we feel so defeated that we eventually just decide to disengage altogether and give up on trying to grow. But what we see in the call of Jesus is something entirely different. If you've got your Bibles with you this morning, I want to invite you to turn over to Matthew chapter 4. And this is going to be a familiar story to you, so stick with me because I want us to look at it from a little bit of a different angle this morning than maybe you've thought or read or heard before. So Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 says this, and this is the very beginning of Jesus' public ministry that we're picking up in the story. Verse 18, while walking by the Sea of Galilee, Jesus saw two brothers, Simon, who's called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men." Immediately, they left their nets and followed Jesus. We read passages like this, and we think, wow, what faith, what incredible faith they had that they left everything. And you may have even heard at some point in a church service or, uh, or in a Bible study or in some conversation about Christianity, uh, they, were, they were incredible disciples of Jesus because they left everything. And so if you want to be a great Christian, you too must leave everything behind. And again, we come to a text like this, and maybe at times when it's supposed to be encouraging, it, uh, it oftentimes feels discouraging and maybe even defeating because you're like, man, I don't know that I'll ever have a faith like that that's ready to leave my family, that's ready to leave my livelihood. And so instead of doing whatever it takes to follow Jesus, you say, I just don't know that I've got what it takes to do that. But I want us to look at this in a little bit of a different way this morning. I want us to look at this through the lens of culture in the first century. Because Jesus was a Jewish rabbi with Jewish disciples living in a Jewish world. Jesus grew up in this region called Galilee. And the Jewish people in Galilee believed that God had spoken to Moses, one of their great historical leaders and fathers in their day. They believed that God had given him the first five books of the Bible that they called the Torah. The Torah means teaching or instructions or simply the way. And the Torah was the center of, in the foundation of their life. It was the focus of their entire educational system in a first century Jewish world. Because in their educational system, they would start at around age six, and they would show up at the local synagogue, and they would have a local Torah teacher, likely a rabbi, that they would show up to when they turned six. This was like their elementary school, and it was called Beit Sefer. And in Beit Sefer, in the elementary age, from the age of six to ten, Jewish children would memorize and learn word for word the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They would spend all of these elementary age years memorizing the Torah, and then by the age of 10, many of them would leave school and leave the education system, and they would go back home to learn their family trade. But the best of the best, the ones who were soaring in education, the ones who showed some extra initiative, would then move on to the next phase of education. Uh, but the others, they would go home to learn the family trade. The next phase of education, those middle school, junior high years, were known as Beit Talmud. The best of the best would be in this educational system where they would then, for the next several years, memorize and understand and own the rest of the Hebrew Scriptures, from Genesis all the way through the Minor Prophets to Malachi. They would spend years in school, in the, in, in the local synagogue, with the local rabbi where they would understand and memorize the rest of the Old Testament. By the age of 14, many of these children who had continued in this education would then return back home where they would learn their family trade. Uh, they would learn trades like being a fisherman, uh, learn trades of 
uh, of making and building things, of carpentry, of uh, something like that. They would go back to their family business. But the best of the best in that moment would then continue on to the next level of education, a high school level of education around the age of high school students today in the first century Jewish world was called Beit Midrash. And after they finished memorizing the entire Old Testament, uh, these students would, the best of the best, would approach a rabbi and apply to that rabbi to become one of that rabbi's disciples. Now, when we use the word disciple, we often think about uh, and often mean when we use this word that, uh, that a disciple is a student, someone who knows what the teacher knows. But again, in a first century world, in a first century culture, Disciple meant something far deeper than knowing information. Because the disciple didn't just want to know the information. He didn't want to just know what the rabbi knows. The disciple wanted to be like the rabbi, to be able to do what the rabbi did. And so the rabbi would grill this student and ask the student all kinds of questions because the rabbi was trying to figure out and find out, can this student be his disciple? Is this student good enough to be his disciple? He wanted to know, yes, if you, if you knew enough, but even more importantly, could this student be like him in all areas of their life? Many times a rabbi would say, you know what, I, I think you love God, I just don't think you have what it takes to be my disciple. And so they would go back and they would uh, learn then their family trade. But if that rabbi thought that the student could do what he did, if if he felt like he could go and do exactly like the rabbi had done, then the rabbi would offer his yoke and say, follow me. Now these disciples, these students of the rabbi, they would often follow their leader so closely that if the rabbi walked with a limp, the student would walk with a limp. Uh, If the rabbi uh, had certain characteristics or uh, had certain personalities or or certain moral ethics, that that disciple would often take great ownership over those in his own life. So in the first century world, to be discipled by a rabbi was to grow like that rabbi. They followed their every move so closely that oftentimes in a first century world, it would be said that the disciple would be covered in the dust of their rabbi because they followed them so closely. Back to our story in Matthew chapter four, Jesus goes up to these guys who did not make the cut. Jesus approaches these guys who weren't good enough, who didn't measure up by society's standards. They were back doing their family business because they couldn't cut it in education. And this rabbi, this first century rabbi named Jesus, walks up to these fishermen and says, follow me. Jesus shows up on the shores of Galilee and he says, I believe you can do what I do. But I believe you can do what I can do, not not because I think you can have the knowledge, not because I think you can live up to some moral standard. No, this way is gonna happen through spiritual formation. Our hope at Mountain View Church is we want to lead people toward a growing relationship with Jesus. And we have got to talk about what growing is not before we cover what growing is. We've gotta do a little bit of deconstruction around former ideas of what it looks like to grow because when we say grow, we are talk- when we say grow, we often think about growing numerically. When we talk about discipleship and growth, we think that that means adding to our Christian activity, uh, that it means uh, going to and attending more church programs. And it's not that these are bad things, it's just that adding good things doesn't always lead to the good outcomes that you're aiming for. Because, and here's the point, because growth is not about being more religious. Growth is about being more like Jesus. 
It's not about information. It's not about amassing all of this knowledge and all of this Jesus jeopardy and having all of the answers to all of the questions that may come up in life. It's not about information. Growth is about transformation. It's about being transformed and shaped so deeply and so thoroughly and completely to be more like Jesus than we ever have been. Now, Jesus, in his ministry on earth, saved some of his harshest critique and correction for those who would be considered in that culture to be some of the most religious people who'd say, who would say that they have grown to uh, their spiritual maturity. And this is what Jesus had to say to them over in Matthew chapter 15. Jesus says this to the religious leaders and those who looked like on the outside they were spiritually mature. Jesus said this, so... For the sake of your tradition, you have made void, you have nullified and made void the word of God. Look at what Jesus says to him next. You hypocrites. These are the religious leaders. These are those whose society would say, you've reached the pinnacle of spiritual success. Jesus says, you hypocrites. Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching is the doctrines of commandments of men. And so Jesus is saying to this group of religious elite, uh, you, you say the right things, you do the right things, you answer the questions, but you know nothing about me. You know nothing about the Jesus way. Jesus is looking at what these religious people have done. He's observing how they've lived when he looks at the religious people who are supposed to be representing God, he says, I'm just not impressed. I mean, imagine Jesus critiquing the way that you do religion. The things that you've done, the knowledge that you have, the, the moral activities that you hold fast to. It means nothing. Jesus went on in Matthew chapter 23 at, at another point in his ministry with another group of religious leaders. He said this, but woe to you, Scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. For you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. For you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte. And when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. Jesus in this moment is like, hey, listen, your discipleship is a disaster. What you're converting people to is completely empty and meaningless. What you're proselyzing, what you're doing, your mission actually turns people into sons of hell. You are destroying, Jesus says. You're destroying instead of discipling people. And your systems don't connect people with the Savior. What you're doing actually distorts instead of blessing people. And that's why, uh, that's why this whole thing can be so disillusioning. Because you can grow up in church. You can grow up in knowledge. You can continue to show up in the places where you're supposed to be. And you can be in church your whole life and never change a bit. What's frightening about this whole thing is that people can be in leadership and not actually look like Jesus. I've seen it time and time again in ministry, in local church work, that some of the busiest people in ministry can be some of the most insecure people in their spirits because they're trying to prop up their inadequacies by doing good things for God. Listen to me. You cannot make God love you any more than he already does. You cannot change the fact that God loves you right where you are and right where you've been. You cannot muster up enough for God to love you more than he already does because God loves you no matter where you've been and no matter where you're at or what's happened to you. That is true of you today. God loves you right where you're at. You can't change any of that by adding religion or spiritual activity or different characteristics to your moral behavior. But oftentimes people are religious, not because they think they need God, 
But oftentimes people run to religion in an attempt to control God. Uh, they, they use religion as an attempt to deal with the disaster of the human condition by manipulating in some way the divine. And I can tell you there are a whole lot of folks who, who think that their morality is an evidence of growth when in fact uh, them clinging on to morality is just evidence of immaturity. Because what God is really after is he's after dealing with our hearts. What religious culture settles for is just the elimination of bad behavior. But friends, growing is not doing more religion. Growth is not just better behavior. Growth is not more Christian activity. It's about Jesus doing a work in our heart and changing the kind of people that we are from the inside out. That's what growth really is. And if you get to this point in your life where you feel like you're doing good and you're, uh, you're just doing things God is pleased with because you're not doing big sins in your life, and the goal of the Christian life is just to eradicate these massive public sins from, uh, from our existence, then you're gonna be in for a startling surprise. Because more activity for God doesn't do a thing in our relationship with God. More content in your life and in your mind will only lead to puffing you up. More hyped up events are not going to change you. And listen, I get it. I get that my job is kind of a Jesus hype man and I, I love it. I get excited about Jesus. But the reality is God wants to change your heart, not just your behavior. And so with that, we've got to understand that environments don't change our heart. Content, religious activity is not going to work. Jesus is here to shatter all of the existing human categories. A historian once said that when Christianity first appeared in the world, nobody even called Christianity a religion. It, was seen as an, it, it wasn't even seen as another religion to choose from. Christianity in the first century and thereafter was called an anti-religion. I mean, even the Roman Empire understood that what Christianity was saying about God was so different than what any other religion said that it really shouldn't even be called a religion because it was in a whole other category altogether, and they were so right. Maybe you've been clinging on and hanging on and looking for religion to answer the questions of your life. Maybe you've been looking to religious experiences to change something in your life, but friends, religion can just become this low-grade, kind of low-grade shame that leads to internal anxiety, that leads to insecurity, that, that I'm not enough, I'm not doing enough religious activity. It, it can lead to this internal anxiety that, hey, have I chosen the right path of religion? Religion can lead to all of this irritability, but friends, Jesus did not come and say, I have come so that you may follow the rules. Jesus said, I have come so that you can experience life. And life, Jesus said, to the fullest. And so it's not, the Christian life and growing as a Christian is not about doing and trying to be good and doing whatever you want. No, it's about, it's about learning to live in God's world, in God's way. And it's all built on trust and love. That's the beauty of the gospel. See, the world promises that you can do whatever you want without consequence, and that will lead to fulfillment. This is what the world puts on display and says, live and choose whatever life that you want, and that is where you will find fulfillment. Religion, on the other hand, says that if you do everything right, you'll finally feel like you're good enough and you'll finally feel like you're worth something in the world because you've matched some religious standard. Jesus, on the other hand, says you're a total mess, but I love you anyway. He really sees us, and isn't this what we want? We want someone to really see us for who we are and love us anyway which is the story of the gospel.
It's only Jesus who sees us in all of our sin, in all of our dysfunction, and in all of our brokenness, all of our rebellion, and he says, I love you anyway. This, this is the way of Jesus. This is the story of the gospel that we find in scripture. It's not about the way of pleasure. It's not about the way of religion. It's about our deep transformation on the inside. It's about our formation, our spiritual formation, which is this process of our inner self and our character being shaped to be more and more like Jesus. We got a call from one of our friends who invited us to a Nashville Predators game, which the Nashville Predators are part of the NHL, a professional hockey team. And they call and said, hey, we've got, we've got four tickets to the Predators game on the glass. Now, if you're not a hockey fan, like, this is where you want to be. You get a front row to all of the action. You get to see all of the fights up close. Uh, they slam into the, like, it's, it's amazing. And it was an incredible experience. But what was better that night was, not only did we get four tickets on the glass, but we got four armband, wristbands, that took us back down by the locker room where we got to meet all of the players on both of the teams. And what was cool was we got to hang out in this area right outside the locker room where all of the players would come and, and meet their family and get in their car and head back home. And we were there and we were hanging out and all of a sudden this lady, this blonde-headed lady walks in with this huge birthday cake. She's wearing a birthday sash and a birthday tiara. Like, man, she kind of looks familiar and so I look over and my wife, Kara, and I are talking and we're like, hey, that's Carrie Underwood. <laughs> it turns out Carrie Underwood is married to one of the all-stars who used to play for the Nashville Predators. And so that night we got to, with her closest friends, got to celebrate Carrie Underwood's birthday with her. It was amazing. You guys know Carrie Underwood, the, the one who sold over 85 million records? Uh, with 28 number one hits, uh, over 50 country music awards. You guys know who I'm talking about? Yeah? Uh, so if you were to run into Carrie Underwood on the street, like you do in South Orange County, <laughs> if you were to run into her and say, oh, hey, Brandon and Kara Reed said hello, she'd say, who? Yeah, you know, Brandon and Kara Reed, they were with, you know, at your birthday party several years ago at the Nashville Predators game. She'd be like, I don't, I don't know who you're talking about. Because the reality is we don't, we don't really know Carrie Underwood. Yeah, we can share some stats about her. We can tell you about her number one hits. We can maybe even quote some of her uh, famous sayings. We can maybe even sing along to some of her songs. But we don't really know Carrie Underwood. And friends, here's my fear. My fear for some of you this morning is you know Jesus like I know Carrie Underwood. Sure, you can sing some of his songs. You know when to show up to do certain things that are about Jesus. You can stand at the right times and sit at the right times. You can maybe even quote a few things. You can talk about what Jesus did and the things he's accomplished, but you know Jesus like I know Carrie Underwood, and that is a deep, deep fear of mine. Because my hope and my prayer is that you would know Jesus with great intimacy in your own life, that you would know and experience the love and the hope and the grace and the goodness and the kindness of your life in such a way that Jesus shapes everything about what you do and how you live. And friends, you're not gonna get there if you just know Jesus like, you, like I know Carrie Underwood. You're not gonna get there if life just looks like showing up and doing religious things. Now we grow more like Jesus when we spend time with him, which is what spiritual formation, which is what growth is all about, our life looking more like Jesus. Growth isn't about sounding more religious. It's not about using these high and lofty Christianese words and praying with some prayer special voice. No, it's not about knowing all of the stats or answering the right trivia or acting 
more moral. It's about being transformed, being shaped, being changed, being reformed to be more and more like Jesus. And you know what it takes? It takes spending time with Jesus. How can we be more like Jesus? It's not complicated, it's not difficult. We spend time in the word. We see who Jesus is. We see how Jesus lived, the way that he led, and how he loved. Listen, it has nothing to do with voting. It has nothing to do with posting things on social media. It's all about being with Jesus. You know how you can tell if you're growing? How do I know if I'm, if I'm growing in Christianity, if I'm growing in Christ? You know how you can tell? You just look at Jesus, and as the great philosopher Michael Jackson said, look at the man in the mirror. Look at Jesus, look at you. Am I looking more like Jesus? One of our kids' favorite things to do when we go back to Tennessee is to look at old pictures. And our family loves to capture memories through pictures. And so our kids, when, when they're back at my parents' home in Tennessee, they love to see old pictures of us because we wore different clothes back then. Like, of course, I was still really cool and awesome, but I had a bowl, a bowl cut haircut. You guys remember that from the 80s? That was awesome. And they think it's hysterical to look at what mommy and daddy looked like when we were their age. There was a time when, when we were looking at pictures and we looked at our son and said, hey, Bauer, who's that? And he said, oh, that's, that's me, that's, that's, that's Bauer. And I'm like, no, son, that's your dad. And isn't that the goal of spiritual growth? Isn't that what Jesus wants for us? That when we look at our life, that when we see how we live, that when we watch how we lead, that when we see how we interact with everyone around us, that when we see how we treat the person at the market, when we see how we drive down the road, when we look at the way that we leverage our leadership in our career, when we watch how we parent, we can see Jesus in every aspect of our life. And friends, that is what it means to grow. So I hope, I pray this morning that as you think about growing as a follower of Jesus, that you can let go of all of the, all of the religious ideas, that you can lay aside this, uh, this idea that it's all about supernatural sayings and begin to look at growth through the lens of Jesus, where he today invites us to simply follow him. If you haven't followed Jesus, I wanna invite you to do that today. You can do that where you're at. You can do that sitting in the room. You can do that watching online. But it's as simple as saying, yes, Jesus, I wanna follow you. And as we do, as we follow Jesus, we've got to follow Jesus together. That's why we're always saying at Mountain View that that we is greater than me. That's why we talk about small groups because there are certain ways that we will never grow on our own. And so as we follow Jesus personally, let's together as a spiritual community, as a family, follow Jesus together. And what we'll see is that becoming more like Jesus is so much greater, so much simpler than trying to become religious. Let's pray. Father, we are we're grateful for the simplicity of how you've shown us what it looks like to follow you. And so God, may we set aside all of these preconditions and myths that we come into that, that we've gotta be more religious, that we've gotta be more spiritual. God, help us to be more like Jesus. Help us to look more like Christ. Help us to live more like him. And as we lead, may we lead like Christ, serving those around us, loving those who are down and out, finding ways to show people what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen.